this video we're going to talk about some testing best practices which really more relates to the best way that you can use Virtuoso to empower your testing. So one of the first things is actually how you can both structure and put together your tests. And a lot of, a lot of this is around really angling towards more in sprint and end to end testing. So previously, if your automation has been more focused on features, or similarly with your manual testing, if you've been doing sort of shorter, more sort of feature based tests, what you can really focus on now is actually creating extensive end to end tests that go across multiple applications, multiple features and scenarios, and combine those more into journeys. So user or business workflow journeys. And this could be, for instance, going from an e-commerce store or an ordering site to place an order, putting a product into a basket, checking out, uh, testing API integrations, but then moving into, let's say, a back-end order management system. That's an end-to-end -end flow that could actually involve multiple different user types. You can test that through one journey. And in that frame, as you go and author those more end-to-end -end journeys, it's about ensuring then you look at creating individual checkpoints within each of those tests. So instead of just writing one long script in a single block, a single checkpoint, split it out, whether it's into pages, scenarios, features, because in this way, firstly, it becomes easy to digest what's actually being tested at each point of the uh, journey. So in this case, clearly we're adding a product to basket. We're going through the checkout. We're combining those in blocks or checkpoints because what this also enables you to do is easily share those so where i want to be able to create new journeys after the checkout then it makes it very easy to put those breakpoints into your tests now that's the structure of journeys but also thinking about then how you structure your projects so whether you have a project which could be you know per team working on different um, different sprint cycles or different uh, platforms or projects whether you're an agency that's delivering to different clients and you structure your projects in such a way or whether you have a master project and then you copy across selected goals and journeys to be run in side projects by different teams so the structuring of projects can be really important the way you structure your goals because goals can easily be forked so copied whether you have a goal that you create for your full regression pack, and then you create a copy to then only have selected goals running. So you could, for instance, make a copy and then from that remove out uh, journeys that you don't want in there. Then it's an easy way to uh, uh, be able to manage without having to recreate from scratch. Equally, you might say on each release, some of our customers will have a goal specific to each release cycle. So they create their, their, their goal. Then once they finished their uh, release cycle, they will make a copy and then rename that. So for instance, this could be my uh, next sprint uh, copy. So you can go ahead and make changes to that. That's just different ways you can think about structuring. Now as well, you can do things like when you come into your journeys, you can be tagging your journeys. So for example, I could have journeys which have tags on them. For instance, this could be my regression and I create a tag, create that, and then assign that tag to this journey. Basically what you're doing then is you're tagging these out. So within a single goal, you can have different tags and then this enables you to really easily see. So if I wanna selectively run, I could just pick those that I've labeled with my tags. Via our APIs and CICD tools, you can also parameterize by calling our APIs to just run selected tests based on tags within a journey. So that's really sort of thinking about the structuring of projects, goals, journeys, and checkpoints. Now, other things we find are that people, things like, for instance, wait times. It's really important to think about the fact that you do have these dynamic waits. So rather than writing wait two seconds, which you definitely can do, thinking about these upper thresholds, but otherwise having a dynamic wait. Wait 20 seconds or for the go to checkout to appear. That's one really common thing that, you know, is a difference from what you're doing today typically in automation. So leveraging those wait times to ensure that your tests always run as quick as they can for different environments. The next best practice is to think about data, data management. So, you know, whether it is through the different methods we've looked at, so it could be from uh, using test data, so where we set up test data tables. So this can be good if you do have 
fixed products that you need to create or sort of very sort of uh, application specific data which you can't let's say generate randomly but can be used let's say when you are going and then creating data that needs to be in predefined formats test data can be good in that context random data really is very powerful when you need to create more generic data you know user details which don't really follow any need to have them in any sort of fixed way you literally just need first names last names addresses phone numbers so random data is incredibly useful for that more generic data so you just don't have to worry about predefining it so long as you know that that it fits obviously within the parameters of the application for instance you can only have a first name that's up to 50 characters that can be facilitated with random data then equally though thinking around data the fact that it is incredibly powerful now to use apis and in fact there's a couple of things here one is leveraging both apis to create or rather get data so if you want to get existing user details product details that exist in an environment making api calls to store those in responses and write those into your tests again is a really good way to ensure that you don't have to worry about what data is it exists in the platform and you know whether that reflects the fixed test data you have because you're literally making api calls on the fly but then also this is a really interesting point about using apis as well now with apis uh, typically what we find is that you know actually it's probably more to say that when people are trying to test uh, data-driven applications so it could be platforms that have lots of data records for example they might try and test all the data from the user interface so go in and say if I have a list with 500 records I want to go and look for all 500 records whereas actually it's thinking more about more thinking about the functionality that a user would experience so if there's a table for instance with multiple pages that you have to do click backwards and forwards then as a user you want to be sure that I can click backwards and forwards at least once through the table. I can go to the end of the table, the start of the table. I can filter to sort up and down. So certainly those are functions which you need to be able to test. But from data, it's more to say that you typically may not really want to be testing all of the data in the UI level because in principle that can be facilitated by API calls. You can actually call in and test data, whether it's via APIs or actually testing it in the back end where you know it can be facilitated with uh, more scripts or part of unit testing as well so it's just to sort of actually think that what you're really shifting to here is more user focused or business workflow tested end-to-end -end tests that are more looking at those business workflows and so it's actually in some sense some people say to us this is actually more thinking like a manual tester but for us actually there's I don't necessarily think there's a distinction so much between manual and automation testing per se. It's more their modes of testing. And so actually, if what we're talking about is the mode of testing, so thinking more about the workflows and the sequences that you go through on an end-to-end -end journey, if that's what you're doing in manual testing, then certainly then you can be now facilitating that through automation to be able to validate more on those flows whether it's through the functions whether it's through different uh, applications that can be opened in uh, separate tabs or whether it's also leveraging the api layer is to actually think there is a transformation transformational aspect to using virtuoso so hopefully those were some good start points to start get you thinking around some best practices where we certainly have more resources available via our website and documentation to start to drill into those and would welcome discussions as well on any of those areas to assist you building out strategies for your testing.